Hello, and welcome to Time of Death. I'm your host, Dee, and I'm Riss, and we're your hosts of Time of Death. We're here to talk about some spooky, scary, creepy, spine-tingling stuff. Mm-hmm. So hold on to your mittens. Hold on to your mittens, kittens. Hold on to your mittens, kittens. And Riss, do you want to give them your little spiel? Sure. If you are new here, this is Time of Death. We are hosted by two nurses and we like to delve deeply into true crime cases and give our perspective Um, we like to focus on either crimes that are about a medical professional who has done evil things some kind of medical aspect or yes or some or a crime that has a medical aspect or a medical professional as a victim so without further ado it's for you d Buckle up, kittens. It's going to be a ride tonight. So this takes us back to 20. No, not 20. 2006. I was going to say 2006. 2006. (laughs) Where little D is a middle schooler with a fascination for the macabre. Now, I waltz into Barnes & Noble with my little gift card and I purchased a book called The stories of the history's most evil murderers, serial killers. And I hid it in my room because my mom was not about that life. So, trademark, I've been a creepy gal since 2006, which is when this book came out. Yes. So, this whole true crime uh, thing is not a fad. It's a lifestyle. Exactly. Tell that to your mom. I still have not told her about this book, but now she's here <laughs> sitting here awkwardly looking at me like you. I was a bad kid. And just for you listeners, she also annotated the book. <laughs> Over the years, I've read this book, so I'm pretty familiar with most of these cases. So I went back to H.H. H. Holmes, who is the second right after Jack the Ripper in the book. And H.H. H. Holmes, as we all know, I'm an avid Sherlock Holmes fan. And I was really pissed reading about this guy because I felt like he really tarnished the good name of Sherlock. He gave him a bad name. So they refer to the castle that he creates as Holmes Castle, but we will not be referring to that in this podcast. We'll call it Murder Castle. Not okay. Holmes Castle. I refuse to drag the good name of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's literary detective through this, the mud. Okay, that's fair. So, just to let everyone know. So, let's get into it. Herman Webster Mudgett, which I think is one of the grossest names ever. <laughs> I am like, I love Herman as a name because I associate it with the monsters. But, anyways, I digress. Herman Webster Mudgett was born in Gilmantown, New Hampshire, May 1860. Now, there's some debate. He went on later to say that he was born actually in 1861. This is a chronic issue with things in the 1800s where record keeping was just simply not up to par. And as we will find out, Herman is a compulsive liar. So bear this in mind. So. There's a lot of different information regarding his childhood. He told everyone, by his own account, he was a mama's boy. However, there is a very different picture than the one that Herman had created. Both of his parents were devout Methodists who demanded total obedience from their three children. His mom was described as cold and distant individual whereas his father was an alcoholic, and he was a very strict disciplinarian who often employed physical abuse in order to keep his kids in line. Some of the methods that he used include prolonged isolation, food deprivation, and he also would stuff kerosene-soaked rags in the mouths of the kids when they were crying. Oh, boy. Young Herman often sought refuge in the forest where he would be dissecting animals that he found. Oh, there we go. 
Red um, flag number one. Actually, I would say red flag number two because serial killers are six times more likely to have experienced physical abuse in their families than the general population. So I think his childhood really needs to be taken into account. But there are also people who have gone through similar childhoods, if not worse childhoods, that don't go on to become prolific serial killers. Young Herman was also bullied in school. Uh, there was one instance where he was forced into a doctor's office where the skeleton that they had, like skeleton model, was like forced on Herman and touched his hands very creepily. And he was very scared, but he later said that this event was the reason for his curiosity in pursuing anatomy. He later went on to medical school and he like credits that experience as being like the catalyst for him wanting to look into medicine. So I'm confused. There was a skeleton, like a skeleton. So like in the figurine 1800s, especially the late to mid 1800s, they would use skeletons as like very commonly as like the anatomy models. Real life skeleton? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, I think they still do. They still do, but it's probably less common now. Okay. But then that was really the only one of the only tools they had in order to better understand the human body. Okay. So understandable, but still very creepy. So a classmate took the skeleton and rubbed the skeleton hands on him? Yeah, they, like, touched him with it. Oh, I see. So... I feel like that would be traumatizing for a child more than, oh, hey, I really like this. I'm going to go into medicine. I know. But, yeah, I feel like that would scar me. But Herman is a weird kid. So maybe things just translate differently for us. Yeah. I also want to note that there was a suspicion that he actually went on to kill one of his childhood friends. Friends. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was a bully. Tom, who was an older kid. Because Tom had fallen off some cliff or some hill or something crazy and there was a suspicion that herman had shoved him mm. so that's another red flag oh yeah um mysterious deaths <clears throat> mysterious deaths so at age 18 he goes on to marry clara levering and within the year he left his wife now you think that oh hey maybe it didn't work out they're young this is a pattern for herman he will go on to Marry women, court women, seduce them, and take all of their inheritance. So it's very probable that he used her for a financial gain. This is definitely a pattern. At one time, he had three wives in three cities, and he went on to swindle all of them. After he left Clara, he had enrolled in the School of Medicine at the University of Vermont in Burlington, however, found the program too limited and entered the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which was one of the leading medical schools in the West at that time. So he's smart. Budget, a.k.a. Herman, graduated in 1884, and he was well on his way in his criminal career. He had embezzled the proceeds of a book-selling trip through his alma mater, and he also was a grave robber at that time. He would sell the cadavers to med schools, and after he had graduated, he really needed the money to start his own practice. So he then started doing insurance scams, oftentimes using those cadavers. How this works is you take out a life insurance policy and then you produce a body. So in the Oh 18th, my God. Yeah. Very crazy, very underhanded, and total blatant disrespect for yeah. the people that he was dealing with. So it seemed like wherever Herman went, whether that was New York, Philadelphia, or when he finally settled in Chicago, people seemed to die or just disappear. In Springfield, Illinois, he gained his license as a druggist, which is a pharmacist in today's language. And this was in July 1886. It was the same year that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle first published the stories of his famous detective Sherlock Holmes. And he was very inspired by this. Herman went on to t take the new name of Henry Howard Holmes, H.H. H. Holmes. So he was inspired by Sherlock, too. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's terrible. It's really terrible. But he took that and he morphed. He changed his whole persona. So 
Shortly afterwards, he found employment in a drug company in Chicago, and the owner and his widow later went on to disappear mysteriously soon after he came, and it became his practice. So at this time, the World's Fair is going on, and this is the famous White City, which opened in May 1893. So this is top of the line during that time. There's a Ferris wheel, there's a dishwasher, which, you know, is in everyone's house now, that in the 1860s, 1890s, this is out of this world stuff. So there's a not a lot of new inventions coming around. Yes, exactly. I think the fluorescent light bulb was also there during that time. This is over 600 acres and 200 buildings. And 26 million visitors had come within six months, which is the perfect environment, the perfect playground for a serial killer. So by then, Herman is very wealthy. He's very well-to-do. He owns companies. He sells mail-order drugs. He owns houses. And he begins construction of a luxurious hotel. So this hotel has retail shops on the ground floor, one of which, of course, is a drugstore where he works. And on the first floor, there are six corridors, 35 rooms, and 51 doors. Above that, 36 rooms, all of which were ready for the people, 26 million people coming here at this time, who are flocking to this fair, many of which are young women. A lot of people who were coming were from farmlands, impoverished family who were seeking out work. So that's another factor to take in consideration as well. Very vulnerable population. Very vulnerable, and he owns several businesses at this point. Nobody knows exactly how many people entered that hotel lobby and never checked out again. So, I want to give a little bit more information about the hotel. So, in the hotel, or I should say Murder Castle, there is an operating room, there's a torture chamber, there's a room for dissecting bodies and a mortuary. Okay. The floor- Another red flag. <laughs> Absolutely. The floor plan was described as maze-like corridors leading nowhere, concealed passages, sliding panels, secret staircases, peepholes and pictures, trap doors, and metal chutes into the basement. So that makes me feel like. He definitely wants his victims to feel very disoriented Mm because there's a lot going on, very overwhelming, and they're already going to be terrified. They're going to be disoriented as well. They're not going to understand anything about what's going on around them. So that makes sense to me. I think that they took inspiration from this during um, American Horror Story Hotel Cortez. See, I was thinking of that. I was like, wait, is Mm -hmm. this kind of... What they want to base it off of? I think so. I think that um, there's a lot of parallels yeah. between the two cases. I think it was definitely, I forget what the, the name of the guy that is in American Horror Story who owns the hotel constructed it. But yeah, definitely took inspiration from that. I also, like, I can't imagine being in this unfamiliar space. You're trusting this individual. You're in, like, what you consider your home at that point. And you're being preyed upon. Holmes at that time began ordering large amounts of chloroform, which, if you don't know, chloroform is an anesthetic and it could be very deadly. It's like what you in the movies when they hold a rag over someone's face and they pass out. Mm-hmm. That's what that is. He claimed that it was for scientific experiments, but we all know that was not the case. He was using it to subdue his victims. He bought everything on credit, he never paid for anything. And he had this magnetic charm and charisma. One of his managers said creditors would come in here raging and calling him all kinds of names. And he would just smile and talk to them, set up the cigars and drinks, and send them away seemingly friends for life. I never saw him angry. You couldn't have trouble with him if you tried. Which is just a testament to how well he was able to navigate these very difficult situations and instill trust. Within people. 
So about this time, employees at the hotel began to leave unexpectedly. This is the law at that time. Employees who were employed for less than two weeks, they did not have to be paid. So he used this loophole to not only have a lot of turnover and save money, but also a lot of them went missing because he killed them. Wow. A waitress in the restaurant was at work one day and then just gone. Jenny Thompson, a stenographer, disappeared as well as a woman named Evelyn Stewart. Customers and residents would go on to complain about the strange chemical smells, which, of course, he would apologize for and come up with some reasonable explanation using his charm. He would oftentimes invite his friend, Charles Chapel, who was very skilled to strip the flesh from bodies in order to assemble skeletons for doctor's offices and teaching laboratories. So Holmes would explain that, hey, this is my patient, and he died, and he would pay Chapel $36 to then prepare the skeleton, which he would go on to sell, and he would turn a profit. In the weeks before the fair opened, Holmes went through a fake marriage with a young woman named Minnie Williams, who brought her sister Anna with them to live in the apartment that he was renting at the time. He persuaded Minnie to transfer the deed to land that she owned in Fort Worth, Texas, to him. And he promised both Minnie and Anna this luxurious, all-expenses-paid trip to Europe. Unfortunately, after she deeded the land to him, both of them vanished. And there was no explanation where they went. So, of course... Afterwards, the wife of his carpenter, Benjamin Pitzel, um, received clothing for his wife. Herman went on to explain that this was the clothing that his cousin who had visited had left behind and he just needed to get rid of it if his wife could say it. So it's assumed that this was Minnie and Anna's clothing. He claimed that Minnie was in London. So, yeah, that's how he was getting rid of a lot of the personal belongings as well. And I'm sure he was selling some as well. Because this was someone that was going to turn a profit any way that he could. Holmes moved on and he started to pursue Georgiana Yoke, who was a saleswoman in the department store in the area. He offered her marriage and she accepted. But the fair was starting to near the end at this point. And Herman's creditors were beginning to close in on him. And at that time, fall 1893, he was told that his debts were at least $50,000, which is an astronomical amount of money in the 1800s. And he had been just crediting everything. He hadn't paid for anything. Where was all the money from his hotel? He, He was just putting in everything on credit. So what was he doing with all the money from... The hotel. I have no idea. It's weird. He could have been s- squirreling it away, but I, I don't know. I didn't see anything mentioned about a drug habit yeah. or anything like that, but it's unaccounted for. He decided to leave immediately for Fort Worth, Texas, where, again, he owned Minnie's land. And he took Georgiana with him, as well as Benjamin Pitzel, the carpenter. At that time, he went out to take a life insurance policy out on Benjamin for $10,000. Oh, Lord. So, keep in mind, this was one of the scams that he was running. He would take out life insurance on some of the victims and later kill them. He would also, using corpses while he was in med school, grave robbing and using those bodies to put claims out as well. So, this was something he was very accustomed to doing. In June 1895, Detective Frank Geyer arrived in Philadelphia to investigate an alleged case of insurance fraud. And the suspect's name was a physician named Dr. Mudgett, a.k.a. Herman, who had been in prison for the last seven months. Why was Herman in prison, do you wonder? While he was in Fort Worth, Texas, he had stolen horses and shipped them to St. Louis and sold them for a profit. He was arrested for swindling. 
this man will not stop. Will not stop. He does all kinds of stuff. Not even just one, like, this is how I'm going to make money. He would have made great money as a physician. But that was not enough for her. He needed to swindle and steal and lie and murder. And it's terrifying. He had no remorse, no conscience. While he was in jail, him and his cellmate, Marion Hedgepath, hatched a plan together for, you guessed it, insurance fraud. Yeah. So the plan was Herman was going to fake his death when he got out of jail and he was going to try to collect the insurance policy money. So he tried it. It did not work. And the insurance company was very suspicious and they did not pay. So Herman's like, oh, I still need money. I have Benjamin here, and I conveniently have a $10,000 life insurance policy on him. So he really ki- he killed him. So this is what really begins the downfall of Herman. Agents had tracked down Herman and Benjamin from Fort Worth to St. Louis and then to Philadelphia. And the case of insurance fraud specifically was related to Benjamin. So the reason that this was even on their radar, that this was fraudulent, like suspect activity, is because Marion Hedgepath, his former cellmate, got pissed when Herman did not send him the money in jail. And so he went on to tell the police about the scam that Herman was running. So this was the beginning of his undoing. Herman claimed to the detective, Geyer, that he had used a cadaver whose body type was similar to Benjamin. And he had set it on fire to make it unrecognizable. Unfortunately, it was very clear it was Benjamin. And- Where is Benjamin now? (laughs) Okay, if it's not Benjamin, where where is he? The whole thing is just, it's just crazy. The coroner requested that a family member should come out and identify the body. Carrie, the woman who had received the clothing, Benjamin's wife, was too ill to travel at that time, but sat her daughter, Alice, who was only 15 years old, to identify the corpse. And she agreed that it was her father, and so the claim was then paid. So Alice, the, so this whole situation is so crazy because I cannot understand why Carrie would then allow her daughter Alice and two other of her kids, Nellie, who was 11, and Howard, who were 8, to go on a trip with her. There's a suspicion that he killed your husband. I know, yeah. So that didn't make sense to me at all. So during that time, when they're supposed to be going back to St. Louis, during that time, Alice and Nellie are writing regularly to their mom. And Holmes is eventually arrested for Benjamin Pitzel's murder. After Herman was arrested in Philadelphia, police had found a box containing the letters from Alice and Nellie writing to their mother, Carrie. And... None of them had been posted. So this is a red flag for a couple different reasons because these girls later go on to be missing. Oh, God. Not again. So from the dates on the letters, Geyer was able to construct the route that Herman, his wife Georgiana, and the three children had taken. In the different cities that they stayed in, Alex E. Cook, which is one of the aliases that he used. Um, however, it was very strange in that the children would stay in one hotel and he and his wife would stay in another. Well, there was one instance uh, in Indianapolis. Herman had stayed in a hotel with Georgiana while the children stayed in one hotel. However, Harry and her two other young children that she was with that did not go on the trip stayed in an, yet another hotel a few blocks away from her kids. 
that's just bizarre. To, I'm not victim blaming here, but why would you send your children with Herman, who you're pretty sure killed your husband? I don't understand that. I know you pointed out before, but that's like, why? It, um, I don't understand. I'm not sure. But well, after he was arrested, Herman went on to insist that all three kids were safe and sound. And with his former wife, Minnie Williams, who, keep in mind, he had murdered her and her sister, Anna, and giving the clothing to Carrie, Benjamin's wife. And he claimed that all of the children and Minnie were safe and sound in London. So across the pond. What? <laughs> Bizarre. So eventually Detective Geyer went to Toronto and there G. Howe and wife, so this is another alias that he used, had stayed at one hotel. Carrie and a daughter at another and Alice and Nellie at a third hotel. There was no mention of Howard, the little boy. And in her last letter, Alice had written, Howard is not with us now. So a Toronto resident named Thomas Reeves had noticed that the description of Herman matched a man who had rented the house next door in October 1894. He let the detectives know, and Detective Geyer, accompanied by the police, went to the cellar of that home where they found the buried bodies of Alice and Nellie, the two young girls. Eventually, he returned to Indianapolis, where Detective Geyer discovered that Holmes had asked for keys to a house that was for rent at that time. In August 1895, he searched the home. And he opened a long chimney flue and found a partially burnt little body. And that was Howard's body. So they all three children were found. Not only had he murdered their father, he went on to then murder his three children. I don't understand why he would murder the kids, though. Like, you obviously had motive to kill the dad. But what are you getting out of killing these three babies, these I three children? A, I have a quote that I'm going to share with you that will give more insight into it. After the bodies of Alice and Nellie were discovered and before finding Howard's body, the Chicago police investigated Murder Castle. Some of the third floor rooms were furnished just as normal hotel bedrooms and others were windowless, uh, fitted with airtight doors. At least one of the rooms was fitted with a gas jet. And the cutoff valve was found in Herman's own apartment. So he was gassing people from the convenience of his own room. In his office, there was a bank book that belonged to Lucy Burbank. And there was a balance in the account of $23,000. There was no Lucy Burbank that could be traced. The police then went into the basement where they found a vat of acid in which there were eight ribs, part of a skull, a large kiln, a dissection table, which was stained with blood, and tons of quicklime, which if you don't know, a lot of times quicklime is used to strip the flesh from the bone. In the burnt remains, there was women's shoes, more bones, and different articles of clothing. There were an additional two pits of quicklime, which contained human remains possibly those of the William sisters, the two, Minnie and Anna, the two that he had promised to send to Europe. A dumb waiter, which descended from the floors above, and there's also the chutes. They hypothesized that's how Herman was able to get these bodies into the basement. Did he? Was he like the architect of this hotel? He was very involved. So, after this all came out, this castle, murder castle, was burned to the ground. And it was very suspicious that this was foul play. It's hypothesized that neighbors did not want this being a tourist attraction, as this hotel has gone down in infamy, even without there being a physical location anymore. I think it's well, important to note that they're not able to determine whether or not Holmes had sexually assaulted 
any of the women before or after murdering them. But he was very persuasive. He was able to form relationships with these women and convince them oftentimes to give him large sums of money, inheritances, land. So I think it's very probable. I think when serial killers or people who commit crimes are very charming, the Ted Bundy effect, they're very charming. They're able to sway people to get their way. I think that makes for an especially heinous Mm -hmm. killer or crime committer. But I agree with you. I do think he there was a sexual component or like a pleasurable aspect to him committing these crimes. Because like, why else would you have like a gas chamber? Like you have Mm -hmm. all these extra amenities. Yeah, Yeah. very creative amenities. Like you have a torture chamber. Like you've got a lot. You but you're dissecting bodies. Like I definitely think he's deriving some pleasure out of these murders. Yes, and this is. There's so many layers to this. It's like this, like I feel like I, because I want to do justice and I want to hold a space for all the victims of Herman, but there are so many of them that we just don't know. And that's so hard because he goes on later to admit to 27 murders, but it's hypothesized that could be well into the hundreds. For someone like this, he kills just, he he doesn't even think about it. He just, all right, this will solve my problem. Or, all right, I'm just going to do this today. I'm going to kill these kids. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, there's no rhyme or reason for some of the things he does. Like, he just will do it just to get it done. And there was definitely a financial element of why he did what he did. But with those kids, I didn't see that he had... I think those kids were different in that, and he could have murdered children as well that we just don't know about, but I did not see a clear rationale as to why he would have killed, if that makes sense. So, Holmes went on to stand trial in Philadelphia the fall of 1895 for the murder of Benjamin Pitzel. It did not take long for them to find him guilty, and While he was in prison awaiting execution, he wrote out a confession, which admitted to killing 27 people. Again, I just want to also touch on he was a pathological liar. So I think that there was some reverse pleasure in him only admitting to 27 as well. This is your time to really come clean. This is your time to give like closure to these families and these victims. and. Only admitting to a fraction of that, that's a slap in the face. I like. Yeah. And you're robbing all of these families of closure and being able to potentially find the bodies yeah. and get become more at peace with it. But you now this guy just, I think he has no regard for human life. He has no regard for other people. He's just in it for himself. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. In that confession, he writes about Nellie, Howard, and Alice. From the first hour of our acquaintance, even before I knew he had a family, referring to Benjamin. Benjamin would later afford me additional victims for the gratification of my bloodthirstiness. I intended to kill Benjamin. He is such a pig. On the morning of May 7th, 1896, Herman ate a breakfast of boiled eggs, toast, and coffee before he went to the scaffold to be hung. As the rope was put around his neck, he turned to the hangman, smiled, and said, Take your time, old man. And those were the last words of Herman Webster Mudgett. Now, there are claims that Herman was indeed the devil incarnate, and here are some examples of that. Frank Geyer, the same detective that was instrumental in the arrest of Herman, was taken seriously ill after he was hung. The warden of the prison in Philadelphia, where Herman had been held, actually went on to commit suicide as well. The foreman of the jury that found Herman guilty 
was accidentally electrocuted. And Emmeline Cregan's father was horribly burned in a boiler explosion, was one of the victims as well. The priest who delivered the last rites on Herman's body was found mysteriously dead on church grounds. And finally, a fire completely destroyed the interior of Chicago's DA's office, leaving only a photograph of Herman untouched. I don't know. Those are that's those are bizarre stories, but maybe like evil is seeping out of him and he just like is touching, unfortunately, all these blameless victims. Reading that, that's just a lot of coincidence for a very small group of people. Yeah. And I do believe in the supernatural paranormal. Yeah. I do. I think that there are some people who walk this earth. I think people are inherently good. However, when you do things that are evil, I think evil seeps into your core. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe he really was some a malicious spirit that yeah. went on to be a blight on the earth. Yeah, it seems like he just took and took from everybody around him. He did. And he was so focused on the financial aspect of things. He did not give back in any type of meaningful way. He just is a bad freaking dude. But Herman, I don't even want to say anything to the afterlife because I'm afraid he's going to come get me. I (laughs) raise my fist and yell into the universe, but I'm a little afraid to do that tonight. We'll be a little more (laughs) bland tonight. (laughs) But I just feel bad for the victims because we'll never know. Yeah. He just, someone just walking through life, unfazed by other people. Un, just unwarranted acts of evil to mm. everyone around him. So the time is 1917. For all of you non-medical, non-military, non-people who use military time, uh, it is 7.18 p.m. on a Wednesday night. That's kind of long. It was a long case. Yeah, this was a long case, but no, it's a good one. But... Thank you all for joining us. If you liked this podcast, feel free to rate, review, like us, follow us. We're here every single Wednesday. Um, We usually record at night because we are sleepy. Employed. (laughs) Sleepy, employed people. And then we upload it before I go to bed. So, good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.